Hey everyone, still doing this Q&A thing. I think we got it here. I think this third installment may close us out. Thank you for hanging with us, by the way. I don't know if I'm, did I release these like bam, 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 just Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or did I stretch them out? Did I try to milk it? We shall see. Travis, Travis asks, good evening, Dave. Good evening to you. Thank you for knowing. It is the evening. I hope all is well with you and Tara. It is, although your autocorrect spelled Tara incorrectly. Tara has an H at the end of it. Happens all the time to the best of us. You guys always seem like such a great team. Thank you. Uh, we kind of are. I really lucked out. I found my human. Have you ever had formal training, Travis asks, on how to teach or how to present? Or is it just something you have acquired with experience? Um, all self-taught for the most part. Um, yeah, I have, I've in, enjoyed public speaking for a very long time. Not in school. When I was young, I was real shy. I was a nervous, you know, like geeky kid. I didn't want to be the focus of anything. But it's kind of as my friend Brian Brushwood would say. Like, it's all flight time. That's his phrase. It's not his phrase. People use this phrase. But it's flight time, right? I wasn't as good as I am now when I started. And those videos are still up. Those early days of DEF CON and SHMUCON, like those are my earliest talks. They're up there. And I like to think I've gotten better, but I've gotten better by just doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. Uh, uh, Travis says, I'm curious, if you haven't had formal training, have you ever done your own self-development on how you present information? Yes. If you count being possibly unhealthily interested in myself. I love the sound of my voice and I rewatch my own talks um, religiously. After I give a talk, if I'm obviously like uploading this, I'm, I'm editing it, so I'm going to rewatch it too much to the point of overanalysis, or even if somebody else records the talk. Most of my talks that like, most people know me not from crap on this channel, but because my talks are on other HackerCon channels. They're out there in the world. And uh, all of those, like I find them, I rewatch them, what worked, what didn't, I take down notes. And if I ever give the same, like the elevator, how many of you watched the elevator talk with Howard and I, right? So that talk, he and I worked on it. Like we built that talk over the course of months, like that whole summer. And we sort of workshopped it a little bit with each other. And we took notes, like you're going to speak here, then I'm going to speak, then you're going to speak. And the first time we delivered it, on a stage was at Hope, that New York City Hope Conference, but that's not the first time we delivered the talk. The night before, in the Hotel Pennsylvania, we had a group of people up in the room. I think, I want to say like Mudge was, he came upstairs and a few other people came upstairs and we tried to give the talk. Like we wired the laptop to the TV in the room and we gave our talk and they were taking uh, notes and at the end of that, like, they gave us great feedback. We dropped some stuff. We rearranged a couple sections. We clarified a couple things. And we tightened it up. And, yeah, that's, that's, you're never seeing the first draft of anything from me, even if it's the first time you're seeing it on a stage. I've rehearsed it with neighbors or friends. And then I'm going to try to rehearse it again and get better each time. So that's kind of my process. So I actually have, I, I mentioned this to myself, I, I'll put it down in the doobly-doo. I gave a presentation once. I don't know if it's a public video. It might be, but it's about, like, the talk about how to give talks. Uh, it's cut. It, it was an unofficial recording. Like, my friend Dr. Tran just kind of recorded it on the side of where I was speaking, and it gets cut off toward the very, very end as I'm naming other people I thought are good influences. But it's about how to give a presentation. And I'm one of these days, again, like, even that, I'm going to workshop it and redo it, and I might give it at proving grounds at b-sides or something but it's yeah there's always always reassess 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 you can always hone and kind of kaizen that in and and dial it in make it better and travis says please keep going keep it keep it going on this channel i will for as long as i can i'll keep doing this mez mez asks how did you go about approaching your first clients i can't imagine that's an easy pitch uh, you're not wrong. It's not an easy pitch. Selling anything is not easy. I don't like selling things. Even when literally 
I have a video and I'm, it's like literally about a tool that I've made and I've developed or Tony and I've developed or something. And we're like, Hey, it's on red tip tool. Like, I don't even want to say the name of our site where I sell it. I don't like selling things. So how did core, when the core group got our first jobs, it wasn't like we took out ads. It wasn't like we reached out to companies and said, Hey, you want to have us break into your shit? Uh, it's all word of mouth. It's all business relationships that we already had doing advising and consulting and friends of friends and, and people. This is, again, like I gave a whole talk about how to start your own business, essentially, and how to build a security career. And it it's not how you sell yourself. It's how you network with others and who you know. I'm not the best lock picker. I'm not the best elevator guy. I'm not the best at probably anything I'm known for, but I'm known for it because I put free knowledge out there in the world and people just sort of tag me in on Twitter through, hey, this elevator, tag Deviant, the elevator story. Because I'm thought of as the guy, companies came to us and they said, oh, you do that thing? Can you do that thing for us? I'm like, yeah, we can do that thing for you. Cool, we have a business. So it's kind of like that. Uh, someone whose first name starts with Z asked a superlative question. Sorry, pass. Uh, I promise I will give you deference in the future if you want to reword that question, but that's the rules. Forrest, Forrest S. says, You've talked a bit about the privilege of being a white male and what that affords you on jobs. I was curious how you balance roles on jobs for people who don't fit that description. Uh, being unassuming could be somewhat important. Are you varying what roles you put people in on how you approach a job based on outwardly visible traits like gender or race? Do you end up addressing topics like this in your industry? Uh, thanks so much for being an inclusive and welcoming person. Thank you for taking the time to share your knowledge. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's a very cool question to touch on. And we got a little bit into this topic, but not really uh, in one of the earlier parts of this Q&A. So the way I think of it, yes, like there, there's a lot of, like talk about privilege, the fact that I'm not going to be catching people's like suspicious eye if I'm in their building and they don't know me. If an unknown person is in your building and they look like me, kind of like a derpy, mediocre, middle-aged white dude, you're less likely to think I'm out of place, especially if you work in a lot of the industries that we're breaking into your building. If I am a 21 year old, like black male, even if you belong in that building, even if you were just hired to work in that building, you might get static from someone who's like, hey, can I help you? And you're like, yeah, I work here. This is my new badge, derp. Um, so yeah, would I send that person in as an unknown, as, a, as an employee? Maybe not. Would I send a younger looking person in as a, as a service technician? Maybe. Would I send a femme presenting person in as a site visitor or someone who is, like has an appointment or something? Maybe. But the big thing about running a team, it's a team effort, right? It's not just me like breaking into the building. We, our company and our jobs, we have multiple people. There's, it's way more important the work being done back at the Airbnb headquarters, the people on the phones, the people running, you know, like concurrent with the physical break-in, they're doing phishing, they're doing vishing. People who know how to interact with the local culture, people who can get up to others in a local restaurant or the coffee shop. All those people have a place and a role and it's about slotting people in, in the right way. Uh, everyone is useful at something. And if society were a different place, everyone would be useful at everything. But absolutely, we, we play to our strengths and we work around or make use of our weaknesses, right? So the weaknesses of others, the weaknesses we have, like diversity on your team will always make your team stronger. You just have to use it the right way. Florence, Florence B says, we always love seeing your cats when we watch your videos. Uh, wow, I... You know, I hope you're not watching this with little kids, right? You said we, uh, and it made it the, the way Florence asked the question. I'm editing. It sounded like a family. Um, 
I hope you're not watching with your kids, or if you are watching with your kids, I hope they're really fucking cool about swearing, because that happens on my videos. But yes, I love that the cats are so popular on this channel with all the viewers. Uh, again, I am, I am the guest star sometimes in my own videos, because Frankie and Whisper are way more awesome than I am. So, <laughs> they, <laughs> what they said is, would you tell us a funny cat story? Yes, I will. Cat poop. Cats and pooping. I don't know if you've heard in the background in any of this video or the previous Q&A videos or other videos where I'm over at the other table, you'll hear the scratching and pawing, right? Because cats are poop machines. Every time you have people over, every time you're trying to just settle down and be quiet, somebody's going to drop a deuce and then like paw, paw, flip, flip, paw, paw, scratch, 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 all that jam. Except when you actually care about their poop. So we had our annual vet visit, and that means, hope again, I hope you're watching with your kids for this one, stool sample time, right? So we need a fecal sample, which you'd think is the easiest thing in the world. When you live with a poop machine, they're making tons of poop. Except if you have two cats or more in the house, the vet only gets useful data if you deliver specific poop in a little, you know, tube thing. So you have to catch a cat in the act, which on an average day is easy because the moment you turn around, you just clean the litter box, you turn around, somebody's perched on it. And you're like, really? Except when you need a poop. Then they turn into poop ninjas. You leave the room, you come back, and there's like, who the frig just went to the goddamn, and then you can't leave it in the litter box because you don't know whose it was. And then if, even if 10 seconds from that, you watch Frankie get on the litter box, well, then it's all mixed in. So you gotta clean that out. And then you go and make a sandwich and you come back and there's a goddamn turd. And then you go upstairs and you come back and there's a frickin' other poop. So yes, they turn into the absolute poop ninja masters, just smoke bomb. And it took, I, almost repositioned one of our cameras just so I could like take it off the wall on the outside and put it downstairs so I could watch who the hell was making a deposit at the bank. Uh, but eventually, you know, if you sit down here long enough at the table and just making cocktails, you catch them and, the, and, and I'm looking at the cats as I'm collecting. I'm like, hi, yeah, I don't just eradicate your poop. This one's I'm preserving. I'm actually gonna take these in a car. I'm gonna drive them to someone else and I'm gonna pay that other person money while I give them your poop. The cats were not understanding what I'm saying, but they kind of have always understood that we are not the masters of this house. They, they, they are the stars of the show, as anyone who owns cats knows. One more page, one to go. Adrenaline Dude asks a series of questions. Would it be possible to create a reverse tumbler lock in which it uses magnets? My answer is maybe, but why would you want to? Adrenaline Dude says, could tumbler locks be formatted in a way where the springs interleave with the key? And my answer was maybe, but why would you want to? Could dial locks they ask, be formatted using gears in which each gear turns to a perfect orientation and then it opens. Maybe. Why would you want to? And that's not me throwing shade, right? This is, this is market realities. Anybody can make anything they want, theoretically. And as a fun one-off project, go nuts. Again, 3D printing, is an easy, who's that person who asked, what's, what's a cool thing to make with 3D printing? Make oddball locks no one's ever heard of. The thing is, you're not delivering that to like a store shelf. The market already has what it needs and doesn't need that kind of innovation. The market doesn't need complexity. The market needs greater simplicity and efficiency. Uh, my favorite example of all of this is the Bowley lock from the UK, right? that weird like 
kind of pick proof lock. I mean, I, I swear we bumped it once, but anyway, it's this J hook thing and you, it's like a pump turn lock. It's a cool freaking design. I think it's ridiculously impractical. It's oversized. The key is oversized. The key snags in your pocket on other keys. Is it brilliant engineering? Yes. Does the market want this product? No. The market wants keys that are small and look like keys. The market will not really bite on something that is super innovative, especially if it's needlessly complex or very expensive. So this is not me saying don't be interesting. Um, again, like the talk that Carl and Ian gave, the talk at Sky Talks about the revolution in firearm design and 3D print. It was, it was literally a very Max Headroom talk. It was like 30 seconds into the future, a little bit before its time. They talked about how weird designs and firearms that never got traction in the marketplace might show up again as people start working with different materials. And the idea of 3D printing, this is before anyone was 3D printing guns really, other than Cody. Um, yeah, like the Schwarzlosa pistol and other blow forward stuff, like weird designs have a place if they're solving a problem. Is the problem, we are trying to do pressure bearing things with new polymers that are not strong as steel, that design has merit. What problem are you solving with the designs as you described, other than I am brilliantly minded and I want to fidget with design. Go for it, but you're not gonna bring it to market probably. But Adrenaline Dude asks a better question, no, a better question, and a different question. To prevent unauthorized people inside a building, would it ultimately be easiest and the best method simply to have people stationed at each location? validating who enters. Honestly, yes. That is absolutely, because humans can do things that no access control system could ever automate. Humans have instinct, humans have flexibility, and they can, they can analyze things that are new, that they haven't seen before, and pivot on a dime. Uh, the reason you're not gonna see that is cost, right? It, there's massive cost involved in training and paying uh, and maintaining that kind of workforce. It's why big apartment buildings used to all have doormen. They don't anymore. It's cost. Internet Rando says, you seem to travel a lot. How is your this is a good place to eat drink game? Any tips, unconventional wisdom on choosing a good watering hole in a strange land? Any good stories? Uh, yeah, the Bobak method. The Bobak method. What is the Bobak method? The Bobak method is turn out Yelp. You search in your immediate area, very tightly coupled for whatever you're looking for. Open now, sort by rating. Bobak method never fails. The Bobak method found us Comex, Korean Mexican fusion in Las Vegas fed an entire room full of our staff for like 200 bucks. I mean, just like piles of food and it was the best food we've ever had. And now I routinely drive way off strip uh, just to go to Comex when I'm in town. Uh, and the, the flip side of that is never be afraid to hit the bricks and bail. Uh, literally in Florida, f we were trying to get to some place that somebody said, oh, you gotta go to this place. And Carl and I were like, this is BS. This, this looks like, this doesn't look good. Want to, want to freaking bail? And again, Tara and I, we, we can do that with a, with a glance of our eyes sometimes. We go to some place and we're, we're just, we can see it. You look at there, but you go, bail? Bail. Bounce, man. It costs you nothing to steer into the skid and just get the frig out of there. If something's not working, try someplace else. Internet Rando also says, have you ever tried Kava or Kratom? Have you been to a kava bar? Uh, I have not. I generally didn't know what these things are. I see signs at like gas stations for Kratom. I thought it was some kind of herbal Viagra or something. I, I don't know what it is, but I've never had it. I have, I've landed on my launch pad. I got what I got. 
Kava, Kratom. I, it sounds like the kind of thing that people who invest heavily in Bitcoin and are younger than me might know a lot about. Say things down in the comments. Try not to spam URLs to things that you're personally invested in where they're selling it, I guess. Maybe somebody wants to try Kava or Kratom. I'm good. Marvin CZ, are you in the Czech Republic? That would be awesome. Marvin CZ says, we found the lock on one of the entrances to our apartment building with the plug missing. This is the image Marvin sent. We should change these locks to be safe, right? So I'm going to assume this could have been a pulling attack, a, a plug, it's not a snapping attack, but it looks maybe like a pulling attack, but there's not a lot of damage. There's not a lot of uh, scraping and drag marks uh, where you'd think the driver pins would be shearing off. So I'm not sure what happened there. In general, if this lock, was, well, yes, like replace this lock, you probably should. But if this lock was part of a system, like around all the, all the entrances, they were all key to like, yes, I would unfortunately recommend you replace them. And fortunate for you, it looks like you have Euro profile cylinders. So you can just you know, open the door, pull out a screw, turn the thing, zip, zip, and away you go. Why is all the rum gone? Kyle W asks, what question haven't you been asked that we should ask? Thank you for doing what you do. I really enjoy all of your chaotic goodness. Uh, thank you too. I like, I, I enjoy all of you. As far as what question I haven't been asked, uh, I don't know. I, that's, if, if I had been asked it, I would have known. If it's like having a remember all, you know, you, 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 I don't want to reference turf bullshit, like Harry Potter, you, the, the freaking universe exists regardless of freaking fart Joanne. Uh, but no, if, if, if I knew the question that hadn't been asked, I would, I would, I don't know, I'd make it up and I'd make up a name. You'd have a, a dumb name like Adam asks a question and I'd like throw it in there. Uh, but no, I, the, the same reason I talk about superlative questions that are bad, I want to know what interests you. My favorite questions are the ones that tell me what you're into because I get a, a little sense of what makes you all happy and it it yeah it lightens lightens up my life op op asked a superlative question it was about quote strangest techniques uh the strangest ways i've ever gotten inside of a building uh, i could make up a story saying that like somebody delivered me inside of a box and they pretended, you know, uh, but that would be a fake story. It would be a fake story for me, but it would not be a fake story in hacker history. Uh, there is in fact a DEF CON hacking challenge story about someone being delivered inside of a box. I'm not gonna spill the beans here. Um, if you wanna hear, it has to do with the ghetto hackers way back in the day, single digit days of DEF CON. Maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll have Caesar tell the story one time uh, when we're together, but it's a good story. But yeah, that's, I got nothing on strangest techniques compared to that one. Tim says, I hope you're doing well. I am. Thank you, Tim. I know you're often associated more with whiskey and scotch. Not today, but yes, generally, you're not wrong. So am I, if it comes to that. But I got a nice bottle of rum at Christmas, and I realized I don't know any rum-based cocktails other than pina coladas. Ha! Huh. Timely reference, isn't this? Could you please open our eyes to some great rum-based cocktails that we may be missing out on? Well, we saw at the start of this a bazillion years ago and many pages back, uh, DKH is who told me the Barbados rum cocktail that I made, which I have uh, tried a couple different ways now during the course of this, and if you balance it, it can work. It, it's probably not my top one. I think on my channel I made up something that I was calling a trade wins, maybe? Where it was rum and whiskey, and we used like cardamom bitters and, and maybe tobacco bitters. Uh, I haven't made that in a while. Yeah, maybe we should all revisit the trade wins cocktail. I will drop the information down in the doobly-doo of this video. There you go, Tim. Cheers. 
All right, almost down there. Peter B. How does one confirm they are on your mailing list? I forgot if I actually signed up or with which email I would have. Uh, that's a good question. It is a question I do get from time to time. Someone like will say in the comments, like, how do I know I'm actually on the list? Do I have to sign up? Some people love to say, do I have to sign up every time you do a giveaway? No, you do not. It is a one and done process. Uh, the thing is, though, I don't really check the management interface of my mailing list because I don't have to log in to the back end. When I want to do a giveaway, I have a little script that just randomly fetches somebody. But validating that you're on the list, I have never actually done that. No one's asked me that. I'll tell you what, if you want to sign up, just sign up again, right? Like use the same email address. The system will not allow multiple email addresses to be re-registered. Like, and we have a whole Gmail filtering thing, the plus sign hack. Like you can't freaking do that. Don't waste server resources. Uh, yeah, like if you're not sure you signed up, sign up again. If it works, great, you, you're on the list. If it doesn't work or gives you an error or something that you're, you're already signed up, well, you know you've already signed up. So there you go. Um, it doesn't hurt just to do it again. Elijah L. says, I hope you're having a great day. Yes, I am. I was wondering if you have any recommendations about where to find cheap or preferably free training specifically related to access control systems. I have been learning all that I can on the internet for the past year or two now. It's to the point I can't find anything new. Where do I go from here? Uh, so Elijah, you are in the same boat as I imagine a number of people might be. Lock picking, you know, mechanical, you could spend your whole summer just watching YouTube videos and learning new stuff. Access control, there are fewer, fewer options there. I would say a couple, though. Come to DEF CON this summer. Whether or not we want to, the country's opening back up. It's a letter rip scenario with COVID, so DEF CON and Black Hat, they're on site. I'm not saying you have to come to our Black Hat training. It is not free or cheap. But DEF CON is cheap. And DEF CON has the Wireless Village, which includes RFID. I mean, our people are going to be there. We're going to be hanging out. There's also allegedly, I think uh, Bobak was telling me, Jeff asked us if about like doing a, a low cost training after DEF CON is over, uh, not a Black Hat style training, like a workshop, but I think there's a thing happening there. I will edit this video or like pin a comment if somebody can comment on what the hell that is because I haven't been following what DEF CON's plans are with this. So yes, DEF CON, great place to like, get to your local cons or... Iceman, Iceman's Discord. Uh, I don't know if it's open to everyone right now or if it's invite only, but the Iceman Discord, I will drop a link to at least his Twitter, if not the Discord invite line, because there are great people there who are resources to ask questions. As long as you bring knowledge and you don't sap people's energy, you can say, hey, uh, here's this thing. I'm studying it. I know X, Y, and Z because I've done the reading. I can't quite figure out how to unlock this sector on the credential or, well, you know, whatever. And someone says, oh, oh, wow, yeah, that's an obscure version of this. And then it was bought out by Legic. And then, like, they re... Yeah, so here's how that... Uh, here's the commands that they used to be deprecated, but you can try to get these to run in the Proxmark. That kind of thing. That's, that's Iceman's Discord is, like, great for that. If you don't know Christian Herman, a marvelous human. Uh, sometimes it even comes to DEF CON, so come to the Wireless Village. Dimitri says, How would you bypass an infrared motion detector? You've talked about bypassing magnetic contract detectors in your videos, but most security systems use IR detectors. Uh, if they're installed properly, you have like one detector on the door or window, and you know, you're entering, and there's one on the opposite wall. Thank you for answering. Thank you for your, all your videos. Um, so thank you, Dimitri. It's a cool question to ask. So moving slowly is valid, but not practical. Uh, I did this once at actually a, a con in Russia. We were, we were at uh, Positive Hack Days in Moscow, 
and there was a challenge where you had to break into a series of rooms, and there were these plexiglass rooms, and in one of the rooms there was a motion sensor, and I just slow walked it through the whole room until I got across the room, and then I masked the sensor. And my team ran through behind, because they were breaking into a bunch of stuff in this other room behind me, and then they ran through that room, and then we got to the last room, and then we tore that place apart. It was amazing. But that's not actionable, right? Like, you're not going to do that on a job. I will say that plex, I said plexiglass, right, in that contrast. Plexiglass and glass, like low emissivity, low E glass, will block IR pretty effectively. Uh, can you walk through a whole room, like, holding that up? Yes, you could. Is it practical? Uh, again, probably not. On our jobs, we are usually attacking the alarm, not at the sensors. You can mask the sensors. Uh, you can attack, especially if they're wireless. Uh, modern, a lot of alarms now are not hardwired because that's expensive. So there's a lot of ways to, to DOS the system or to mask the sensors. Red Team Alliance, coming at you. We have an alarm training. It's only two days. Yeah, most of the time, we're not, we're not messing with the sensors. We're doing something else in the system. Aaron E. asks, If you were turning 19 years old right now, you know, in 2022, but you have all your current knowledge, what would you do with your life to make a living now? Sincerely, hugs and kisses, blah, blah, blah. Aw, thank you. Hugs and kisses right back to you. I love all of you asking the questions. Um, so it is, I was thinking about this, and I almost misread your question in, in that sort of cocktail party kind of way of asking, if you knew what you knew now six months ago, uh, I mean, it's true. Like, we, we live through ridiculous times. If you had the knowledge of today, six months ago, if you haven't seen, like, Julie Nolke in Canada, all of her videos about explaining the pandemic to her past self, it's kind of how she got her YouTube channel to a million. Yeah, you could be a millionaire not a YouTube millionaire, you could just be a millionaire if you could send an email to yourself a few months ago throughout everything we've been living through. And you could short stocks and do investments or something. But if you were right now, if I had my knowledge right now and I was speaking to a younger me, so that gets informed by the fact that current me doesn't have the same social energy younger me did. Um, I would love to be like a train conductor. I would love to be a pilot. Uh, and not commercial passengers. I'm talking about cargo. I would love to haul freight across this country. What's the old phrase? Boxes don't bitch. Doing something with skill, uh, a highly skilled trade in a way that can be isolated from the, the din of the world, just kind of all alone in that front cabin of a train or, you know, with, you've got your first officer or your pilot, you know, you've got your, your, your other person, your, your cockpit. That's so appealing to me, working long through the night and then, oh man, that's just where I am right now, right? And we'll talk about this later, like socializing is a muscle and we've lost a lot of that during the pandemic, uh, but that's what I would do. If, um, and also, you, what I've lived through recently, we, you know, we talked about hindsight, um, learning, a, learning the, a, a really good skill in the trades, learning welding, learning something like that, uh, where you can do learning electric or plumbing, but well, oh man, if I like welding, but if I was really like a master welder, you take jobs as they come, you go where the jobs are, you can live pretty easily. You could live probably debt-free because your technical training costs money, but not as much as four-year college. Yeah. Would, would that mean that you, the last few years, you're like working on a railroad or you're working up in the shale oil fields or some crap? It might. And as long as you don't fall into the bottom of a bottle at the Motel 6, you're going to retire at like 50. That's a possibility. So look for the next thing that's on the horizon that is a skilled trade that lets you go where you want to go and not be answerable to a lot of dumb politics. Like your job is very directly like, this is my objective, 
I have solved the objective. It's five o'clock, punch out. I would say, you know, hacking and InfoSec, but uh, InfoSec doesn't punch out at five o'clock. We just had the freaking Okta meltdown, right? Like, yeah, if, if InfoSec could learn how to just clock out at the end of the day, it would be like being a steam fitter decades ago. That would be pretty hot, but we ain't got that. All right. JRP, what were your reasons for switching from 81 millimeter mortar cases? Oh, I remember those with the puck padlock uh, as seen in, you know, the packing in the friendly skies and all that stuff to Pelican cases, right? With your Abloy Protec locks. Well, JRP, I can see from your company info, I realized uh, you're up in Canuckistan. Yeah, you're up right on the Bay of Fun Dip, right? So, man, you know this super well. Waterproofness, weight, and wheels. Whew! Humping around those metal freaking bonehead cases. Yeah, they would survive anything we threw at them, but they would absolutely be water permeable. I just came back from Florida where my luggage was getting pissed all over by rain and stuff during the layovers. And, and I, I grabbed it off the belt and like, oh man, like the fact that it was all Pelican cases, I don't have to care what's in there. That's amazing. Plastic weighs less than steel, but the big one is wheels being able to roll. I remember right as we switched, we had a, like we were, had a series of events we were going to. It was with me and Bobak. Uh, we were in like Austria and then we were in, I think, Czech Republic. We, we were bouncing all around Europe. We were probably in Holland. And at one point, we still had the steel cases, one of them or something. And we got off a train. I'm like, oh my God, I have this one steel case. We literally balanced it on top of his Ramoa rolling luggage to get it down the street because you know we, we were young kids we didn't there wasn't uber and lyft and i think it was that i was like man i'm really glad that i bought pelican cases they're they're going to be back at the office when we get home and the next trip was austria or some something where were subways trains platforms and there's no there's no handicap access like it was stairs like hard stairs there was no way we could have done it with multiple metal cases. We barely did it, hump and bouncing our our Pelican cases in a Ramoa down the stairs and up the stairs. And so, yeah, rolling luggage. Oh, my God. Dra drag rolling. You don't need upright rolling luggage, but drag rolling luggage. That makes all the difference. Uh, you know, just the, the time I was just a minute ago, I was at the, the makers match, like between Carl and I, we didn't have to rent a little cart. We didn't have to call a bellhop because we could roll all these Pelican cases full of weird ass guns and ammo and heavy crap in a way that I never could with those steel cases. Those were cool cases. They had a good place in my history and I remember them fondly. That era has ended. Yeah, never, never tell yourself you have to make do with something Alec talked about this on Technology Connections recently. You don't have to make do with something that's clearly worse just because you don't want to spend money. So that's pretty much it. There's our Q&A. I promise I will try to do them more often and not have such a backlog because some of these were old questions. A lot of them were new. Thank you all for writing in. Thank you all for watching and just participating. I will, I will end, I don't want to, you know, be a Donnie Downer or anything, but I will end just by saying I would like to dedicate a few thoughts in a moment to someone who was one of our neighbors here where we live. His name was Adrian. Adrian, um, Adrian's no longer with us. And a lot of people are no longer with us, right? We're living through an apocalypse right now. But Adrian was a very interesting and cool person. Um, he existed in the foster system until he aged out at 18. Adrian went into the army. He served. He was an army medic 
right around the time that America was right about ramping up into the global war on terror. And despite the fact that he had roots uh, here in the Pacific Northwest and he had family and chosen family and friends, and despite the fact that he was a military veteran, Adrian didn't land on his feet for quite a while. Um, Adrian was, was kind of housing insecure. He was living out of doors for a long time, for well over 10 years, just about. And the story of his life is one where he found um, a support system and, you know, he founds a little bit of housing security. And he was a part of our world here. And he was someone that I looked forward to seeing when I could. And he was always hip to what was going on in the area. We would, you know, anytime I cross paths, uh, it, it's not like I was sitting in the backyard with him. I would see him on the streets, right? I would see him around. I would see him when we were crossing paths. But he knew what was, he knew everything. He knew everyone and everything. And he was always quick to tell you what was up. He was always quick to tell you what was going on. If there was anything shady, yeah, Adrian was the, you know, AD was the reason if somebody was a little bit too chemically altered, if somebody was, was really high or really was just acting the fool, I wouldn't mind in the neighborhood because, like, if AD was around, like, he would, he would run and he would throw hands if somebody was, was getting in someone's face, right? Like, he was there for people who cared about him. And he is sort of like, I would say, the success story of finding community and, and neighbors watching out for neighbors. And he had, he had found stable housing. He had found a job. But the pandemic hits us all in different ways. And the downturn made jobs harder. And the downturn made health harder. And he lost family members due to the pandemic. And... I recently learned that we lost our friend and neighbor, Adrian. Not specifically, directly due to the pandemic, but I guess I saw another fellow who, who's sort of out of doors, right? I saw Will, and I was like, hey, you know, how's it going? What's, what's, what, how you been? You know, like, I haven't seen AD around, and I learned I hadn't seen him in a couple months and, and was like, oh no, he, he died. And I didn't know why. And we talked about it and it's, um, everything that's just been going on, it was too much for him. And, you know, he, he, he wasn't really having it. So I guess what I'm saying is we're trying to get back into things, whether you think we're ready for it or not, um, the country is getting back into things. The world is getting back into things. And a lot of us have atrophied our social... Mu it's a muscle, right? Like staying in touch and learning how to human and being in touch is something we haven't exercised. But you never know what someone's going through. And... If you have friends and loved ones, I know it's really become hard to stay in touch and we've all found different mechanisms and different ways of doing what we can, but try to get back into it. Try to start doing those exercises again because you never, you never know who is just barely hanging on and how close they might be to not being here anymore. There's a lot of people in our lives who aren't, they're not the people you call every day. They're not the people you see every day. You don't, you don't think about them. Oh, I didn't see that person in a few weeks. You know, they're doing their own thing. You don't think about it until you get hit with the reality that you're not going to see them ever again. And then it, it's real. Don't wait to try to re-engage. Just, um, just reach out to people. Pick someone, pick someone right now. Not, a, not everyone. Pick someone in your, con scroll through your contacts list after you watch this. Just scroll and find one person 
that you're like, damn, I haven't talked to them in a while and they matter to me. And just send them a message. Blenster does this. To some, I know some other friends of mine who do this. And it feels, you know, it, you might feel weird to you. You're like, oh, why am I getting this message from this friend? Imagine how hard it is for them to be sending that message. The, just be vulnerable to be like, hey, I haven't talked to you in a while, but I miss you. Are you okay? How you been? Just that check-in might be what gets someone to the next day. So, yeah. We're ending on the DV downer note, I guess. No, we're not, um, not going to do that. I don't know. Maybe we are. Nothing like a depressant to shake the blues away. Just be kind. Be kind and um, watch out for each other, okay? I might throw a little clip at the end of my friends Ty and Ingrid and a song they wrote. If you weren't crying already, you will at this one. Just, um, just watch out for each other, okay? You never know what we're all going through until you just pick up a phone and talk and you realize we're all going through it. And it's okay to be going through it. But you're here. Every last one of you is here. You've made it this far. We're all going to get to the next page. Sometimes all it takes is a phone call or a text or a signal or anything like that. And every one of you, I see you and I hear you and I hope you feel seen and loved and appreciated because I really value all your voices and all your thoughts. And I can't thank you enough for getting me through this. And if we've gotten this far, I hope we all keep getting through this. Thank you. Watch out for one another. Take care of your neighbors and stay safe out there, okay? Oh, my friend, was it quiet at the end? Was your voice sore from trying? Were your bones bent from crying? Cause I know how the dark makes its way into your heart And whispers in your ear that it's better over here Uh-huh, uh-huh Well now I guess you know what it's like to lead yourself back Strings on her lonesome violin will all.